Thank you. Um, welcome to Scrutiny Panel and um, to all our guests in our virtual meeting room and to everyone watching online. Um, this meeting is being recorded um, and live streamed now. Please, can you all keep your microphones on mute throughout the meeting? This will prevent audio feedback. If you're still getting feedback, please turn off nearby devices. If you'd like to speak, please raise your hand to get my attention. State your name and affiliation before you make a comment. For any virtual attendees, the chat function must not be used to have conversations with other participants or provide personal information. All chat is recorded. This is a formal council meeting. Please only use the chat function to alert me that you wish to speak, to raise points of order, or to report technical problems. Officers will assist you. As this is a formal meeting of Hackney Council, please note the press may be in attendance. The right for press and public to record and film the meeting will apply. So, turning to the agenda. Um, item one, apologies for absence. Um, I've got apologies for Councillor Potter, Councillor Joseph and Councillor Hayden. Um, and Councillor Hayhurst is attending online. Are there any other apologies? No. So, um, and welcome to um, Councillor Alan Lynch is attending online. Um, and also uh, Bruce Duvile and Victoria Sarif. So no other appointment. So I come to uh, the items, or just a bit under a because I haven't been notified of anything. Item C, declarations of interest. Are there any declarations from members? No, thank you. So going on to our first standing item, which is item four, Hackney Council complaints and members' inquiries. Um, we've 45 minutes of this item. This report um, has been prepared in accordance with the scrutiny panel's remit to monitor the council's complaints and inquiries process. The council's annual report complaints 2022-23 provides an analysis of the volume of complaints received, performance of the service, progress being made of improvement work and quality assessment from complaints and members' inquiries received in order to ensure that learning from the service and the learning is being adequately shared. Scrutiny panel is reviewing how the council is responding to complaints um, to consider if they're being dealt with successfully at the first stage, that's reducing the numbers in later stage, the later stages. So I'd like to um, welcome to the meeting for discussion um, Councillor Rob Chapman, Cabinet Member for Finance, Insourcing and Customer Service. Um, Bruce Devile, Assistant Director, Business Intelligence Selections and Member Services. And Victoria Sariki, I hope that's the right pronunciation, project manager for housing transformation. So and I'd also welcome perhaps like Carol Williams, who I've just seen joining us online. Um, so I'd like to um, invite Bruce to unmute his microphone to highlight the key points of the report. You've got about 10 minutes. Thank you. Yeah, um, it's obviously a, quite a, a long and detailed report, and I'd make no apologies for that because there's a lot of information there that I think um, members need to be aware of. Um, in sort of in summary, we continue to see sort of substantial increases in um, numbers of both complaints and inquiries from from members and and MPs. Um, we are now uh, approximately sort of double the double the historical norms. And we're starting to see, I think, a new historical level for for these, at least for the um, the foreseeable um, picture. And that's a picture that's across other authorities as well. We're not we're not unusual with that. This is this is sort of uh, sort of the way of the world now post um, post COVID. However, obviously, um, lots of things we organisationally can do to um, do better in terms of um, responding to those complaints and preventing um, preventing further further complaints. Um, we've had in 2022-23 just over sort of five thousand, almost five thousand four hundred stage one um, complaints, of which three hundred and forty four went on to be stage twos. That's an escalation rate of six point four. Um, percent, which again is is in line with what we've seen previously. So we're not seeing more escalation of issues. We're just seeing more more issues raised. Um, the number of um, inquiries from members and MPs is uh, was four thousand 
just over 4,300 for the year. Um, and I say both of those figures are sort of about double the double the historical norms. In terms of um, response times, despite the increase in in numbers, we're actually we've actually responded to those quicker than the previous year. Um, so stage one complaints were dealt with on average in 23.9 working days compared with um, 32.1 the previous year and stage two in 22 versus 23.5. So considering the pressures people are under were actually um, dealing with them quicker. In terms of um, what the areas people are complaining about, um, unsurprisingly, I think for most of you around the sort of table on the virtual um, table, the, the leading areas is around housing repairs. Um, and we'd um, obviously expect higher numbers of um, complaints compared with authorities that haven't got an in-sourced in -source service. Um, following that, again, the areas are the ones of traditional high higher um, volumes around benefits, revenues, sort of following behind on that. So they, there's no unusual sort of areas in terms of what people are complaining about. Um, this I won't go through it, but the report contains a whole section around learning and the work that's being done around learning from complaints, which I know is um, key to a number of members' hearts. So there's a, a number of examples in there around the work we're doing around around that. Um, it's obviously bringing a lot of pressure to, to teams and there's a lot of pressure on those people dealing with dealing with this which is um unsurprising but at the moment we're just about um just about coping with uh with that um obviously if people remain unhappy they can go they can go on to the ombudsman um the numbers of going on to the ombudsman is has not jumped significantly and we've seen an improvement in terms of outcomes of the ombudsman this year and the the number of detailed investigations are um we sit alongside others there's a the table in there which gives you the, the comparisons but we sit sort of in that um sort of same sort of playing field as as our peers alongside us so we're not we're not an outstanding sort of an outlier in any of any of that um Lots more I could talk you through, but there's obviously lots in there, and probably easier to sort of take questions if that's the way you want to go. But quite happily to go through any further bits in detail. Thank you very much, Bruce. Um, I don't know, Councillor Chapman, whether you want to add anything by way of means of introduction. You don't have to. So, but... you, uh... yeah. I'd, I'd largely leave it to, to Bruce to thanks for your presentation there, Bruce, and um, uh, to answer questions. Just that obviously there's been a big, big increase in complaints as we come out of lockdown, and it's just, um, as Bruce said, we've uh, always pressured, but um, you know that's the way the world is, and we, we do our best to deal with them and learn from them, as set out in the report. The, the, the report just brief is, is mainly about complaints rather than members' inquiries, but I just use this opportunity, if I may to announce that um, we now have um, a full-time you know, a, a full members' inquiry team set up at last. We've got uh, re-established re in the Mayor's office. And we have um, uh, a new head of complaints, Ben, ben, ben Amin uh and now five staff, uh, fully, fully staffed. And I think the intention is in the new year to uh, organise some contact with members, including scrutiny, and a drop in to, you know, so we can begin. I mean, the, we should see an immediate improvement in responses from the people who are there already. But um, obviously, we start need to look at systems and procedures all over the council, and we'll uh, be looking to input, obviously, from members on their views and ideas as we do that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Obviously, I don't want to take Bruce's thunder away in doing that, but I've got. I'm, yeah. I, 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 I couldn't miss the opportunity. 
obviously it'd be really good to hear more about uh, about that in um, in due course. Um, I would propose that we should probably take the questions in relation to this report in sort of first sort of more general questions and then sort of subject specific questions. I do know that um, and I think rightly there's going to be a bit of focus on housing. Um, yeah, on housing and plates because um, I think as, as Bruce has recognised, there is an extremely large volume of this, and I think you're going to have some specific questions on that. Um, so, just starting off, um, a sort of more general question um, for me. I mean, obviously, there's been quite significant rises, the numbers of complaints and also, you know, um, ombudsman's complaints. Um, although, you know, now I do accept that there are some figures that are going in the right direction, but obviously there's a really sort of significant um, number of our residents who are dissatisfied with our services. Um, I just really wondered whether what sort of analysis has been done really about the sort of underlying reasons for this, whether there is, I'm sure there's not just one reason, um, but, you know, but, but you know, um, and how, you know, and how as a service we're going to respond, because this is obviously, um, you know, every dissatisfied resident is somebody who's been, um, you know, feels they've been let down by council services um, and, you know, responding to complaints and obviously it, um, potential um, conversation is obviously, you know, um, a, dr a drain on the council's um, constrained resources. So I just really wonder what the, um, you know, obviously you've said some things about the strategy, but these have been really, really large rises. And I don't think we can sort of ignore that. So I'd like to hear a little bit more about, um, you know, what's going to be done about this and also whether there's been any work done really with our sort of neighbouring councils about, you know, collaboratively about the way that they've been but they've got similar situations and good practice about how they've responded. Yeah, um, there's a, a sort of another sort of in three point eleven. There's sort of a, a breakdown of the main drivers in each in a table of the main sort of drivers in each service. Um, so that gives you sort of an idea of where where they are. As so that sort of um predominantly housing repairs is the main is is the main volume and is the main focus of of work and then um obviously victoria's on the call but i appreciate victoria's very new um to hackney so i'm not you know um don't want to throw throw under the bus in that in that sense but there's a, there's a lot of work going um going on within within the housing repairs service around um rebuilding um sort of systems and um capacity to to deal with those um deal with those repairs and there's an incredible amount of sort of focused focused work on on sort of the longest worst cases as well to make sure that we're getting the right outcomes um for people so trying to make sure that those um those with the the longest sort of problems the most severe problems um we get those those things right they're often very um complicated uh complicated cases which need to bring in obviously lots of different results lots of different people um and there's i sit in uh, so and i know along with the sort of director of housing and and other senior managers in housing um regular sort of case studies and case analysis of, of those of those cases to go through them and go through what needs doing what are the next steps and to try and resolve those and and get people sort of back and sort of issues sorted for them and issues redressed um but obviously this is as you know there's there's lots of there's lots of volume and um that people continue to work incredibly hard to try and, and try and deal with those but um the the drivers um are sort of from those those senior management within housing which are working incredibly hard on sort of the improvement on, on those housing improvement programs to to drive to drive that change and i've um i know that they've spoken to you at different times about about those sort of pieces of work Thank you. And it's obviously useful for us to, I mean, this was an ask for the case studies and where, um, where you have used 
um, complaints to drive improvement. I mean, I hope that is being done across the services where there is, you know, sort of embedded learning from complaints. Um, so just sort of moving on a little bit, I'm sure colleagues will have questions. Um, you, you say that the costs of complaints are sort of absorbed in including conversation absorbed into the services. Does that include um, the um, legal costs when things are escalated to a legal proceeding? Um, and also, do you have um, a figure of how um, any sort of global figures really about, you know, sort of um, you know, beyond the cost of your own service, um, how much the um, complaints are costing Hackney Council? In, in in short, to a figure, no, I don't. To hand have um, have a figure. Um, I can try and get you a figure because that would be obviously across the whole the whole council. I need to talk to um, to finance colleagues to try and pull that um, together as well as predominantly sort of housing, but. Um, in terms of how it's how it's dealt with that's contained within budgets for each of those those areas so any any cost relating to a complaint will be picked up by um the um the budget of of the service area so if there's a complaint about street scene or housing that requires expenditure then that will be picked up by those those budget areas um, I also had a a point where I said quite a lot about legal costs, about legal costs, whether you could be, I think it could be useful for us to have these figures, and, you know, the light cost of budget scrutiny function. I also said quite about where the legal costs go. Are they absorbed by the services or separate? So predominantly, are you talking about for legal costs for housing cases or legal costs more generally? Well, any complaints, probably making housing, but any complaints because legal cases, where those costs So, so complaints generally don't incur legal legal costs because they they will gen they will be a separate um, process, especially for housing for um, housing disrepair cases, which will go through a separate legal. Um, process so they will not go through the complaints program process so anything in terms of legal disrepair for housing will go through a totally separate statutory process and will not come through the complaints complaints process so generally complaints don't incur legal costs that's not to say they never do because there's always occasions where you um there'll be sort of a legal um opinion or whatever needed on something but as a general rule of thumb complaints will not pick up legal costs okay and final question for me because i'm sure colleagues want to come in um is what is um i mean has the service set itself any sort of i know you're obviously this um you know you're the central um officer in charge um directly in charge of complaints but obviously there are service areas as well have you set yourselves any targets really in relation to reducing the volume of complaints and how how would you you know and what is the you know sort of strategy really for reducing this volume of complaints which obviously you know affects um, officers council services you know as well as financial impact as well as our residents um no in terms of um setting targets because we we never traditionally have set targets around complaints um we we will deal with those complaints and obviously monitor and look at the, everything carefully but we we've never driven targets um because it it can drive behaviors in good and bad from that um but obviously we want to see complaints reduce i mean there's no no doubt about that um so i'm um, so yeah i'm i'm not going to set targets to reduce them but we want and there's work going on across sort of every service to reduce that number of that number of complaints so i mean that's good to hear but i mean presumably there are obviously be service specific um areas where you know the service can operate in their own processes and i do appreciate that would be different for each service but i mean surely the most general learning really about i mean I, there is some embedded in the report um you know particularly about making sure that residents are kept informed but is there any more sort of general learning or you know sort of strategy really to reduce the across our services 
the, the main thing is obviously to get good quality core core services if we have good quality core services then we should throw from that that we haven't got high numbers of high numbers of complaints sometimes changes of policy can drive drive complaints and we appreciate they, there can be spikes related to that and we've seen that in the in the past but we know the big the big driver at the moment is around our housing stock and the need to improve our our universal services across housing and once we do that we should start to see a a significant reduction in in the numbers of complaints um they are the, the housing services the biggest the biggest driver of complaints across the across the council Thank you very much, Bruce. Um, I'll now invite members, um, like Councillor Jerry, you just come in. So what I propose to you is um, the first tranche of questions to be general questions to Bruce about the whole report and then going on to service areas. So has anyone got else got any more general questions? Or online? Oh. Councillor Conway? Thank you, Chair. Um, sorry, can I? Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wondered, how do we, how are the different um, directorates determining what we think the responses should be to the complaints that are raised in terms of, and what I mean by that is how do we make a decision between whether something requires a sort of strategic oversight or whether there is something to just, you know, we realise that there's been an oversight. And I suppose my concern is that we keep introducing different layers and levels of different things that need to happen to, to catch to, to prevent some of these things from happening again and at, to what point do we say that we need to think about things a bit more strategically I'm just wondering how, how is it that we determine um, I'm trying not to talk about anything in particular because it's from a particular area but how, how is it that we determine what um, remedies to any of these um, complaints are yeah, so we, we've got a complaints, obviously, a, a, as you'd expect, a complaints policy, um, and we work within frameworks, both from the housing ombudsman and the the LGO, as to the the determination on on those complaints. So there'll be a whole set of um, guidance and case studies and everything else around how we determine those and the outcomes. Um, also, complaints are signed. Complaints responses are signed off by senior are signed off by senior managers, um, so they will be having that that oversight. And those that get to stage two come through my my stage two team, as opposed to obviously stage one complaints are dealt with within the within services across the council. If they're escalated to stage two, they come into my my stage two team who will deal with deal with those, and we start to pull out those um things that we're seeing more frequently or the big issues of one-offs that can come up that also need that that more strategic input and we will and do go and talk to um directors assistant directors and heads of service directly on on cases where we've got um concerns. so where stuff comes to us and we're not happy with the way it's been dealt with we will go and knock on those doors and and say that we're not we're not happy with the way it's been dealt with and um, start to have discussions about things that need to change. Any follow up? Yeah, so great. Yeah. So I've got a general one about um, stage one and stage well stage two complaints. Um, Obviously, sorry, I thought stage two complaints are quite small compared to stage one. Um, do you think it's because we've um, sorted all the problems in stage one, or the fact is that people don't think it's worthwhile coming during the stage two? So, if they're not happy with their response at stage one, do they think that they won't get a different response at stage two? I mean, is there any way of finding that out? I mean, I get the impression that people don't think the responses, certainly to members' inquiries, are often quite blunt, and the council doesn't often take complete responsibility for its failures. And I find that uh, 
people just give up um, when they get a response that isn't really sorted out the problem. I mean, it's like legal disrepair cases. I, I don't know if we keep any data on legal disrepair cases, but it does seem that um, having dealt with one recently, the, they were, the people were asked to um, settle their legal disrepair case before the repairs were even carried out which seemed a bit strange to me. He's like, withdraw your complaint and we might do we might do deal with the damp and mould. I mean, it would it's, it, to me it would mean it would seem more uh better to deal with the damp and mould and then ask them to withdraw their complaint. I mean I do think that we ought to look at why people don't go on stage two complaints. I think it is because if people feel they've got an answer from the council, that's the answer they're going to get all the way through. And, and somehow we have to make people aware that there, there may be a different answer at stage two. If we've got any any examples or any stats on whether there's a different answer at stage two to is at stage one. Thank you. Um, Thanks, Councillor Patrick. Um, to make to be clear, I think I said it earlier. I'll be clear again. Legal disrepair cases are not part of the the complaints process, so I, I can't comment on on legal disrepair cases. Um, in terms of um, escalation from stage one to stage two, um, we are in line with um, other authorities, um, and we at the at, on every stage one response it clearly states how you can escalate to stage two um so it's not being it's not being hidden um so it's there and it's used we know it's used because we're dealing with those um we're dealing with those cases and the increased number but that increased number is in line with the volumes of the stage the stage one hence the escalation rates about the same um we i couldn't give you the figures off the top of my head but um we do change outcomes at stage two um and it's we look at it as a fresh a fresh investigation it's a fresh pair of eyes it's an independent team um so it's it's not a a rubber stamp of stage one um it will rubber stamp stage one if it agrees with it and equally and does frequently um give a different um a different outcome at stage to if it disagrees um, with it, or sometimes it's just um, a push along to get things to get things done. Thank you, Councillor Ajayi. Thank you, Chair. Um, this is sort of a follow-on to Councillor Patrick, um, particularly in respect of stage two complaints. I think there is a lack of what well, I'm not sure what the issue is. I can only talk upon the cases that I've dealt with a lack of clarity in respect to what is considered a stage two complaint. Largely, once people have received a response to stage one and they have a further complaint, they lodge that complaint, which isn't necessarily then escalated to a stage two. And I'm not sure as to the reason for that, because there's been cases that I've had dealt with that have lasted approximately 12 months. And throughout that process, there's been that back and forth, but never that escalation to a stage two, despite the fact that responses differ from the first response received so it'd be helpful to kind of try and understand that process a bit more and my second question is also respect well adding on to that often residents find a lack of customer care in terms of communication with them throughout the um, throughout the complaints process so we've have I mean, been outlined in the report that can it depends on to, as to the kind of severity and the nature of the complaints but within that, after two to three weeks, when our residents are still not hearing back from the complaint services and then have to actively chase and then still not necessarily get a response in a timely, timely manner, there, there's deep concern about people who are kind of heavily engaged with the service and complaint process as a whole. And so kind of clarification as to what kind of level of communication is undertaken with our residents step by step would be helpful as well. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you, Councillor Jari. Um, stage two, um, the, the escalation stage two, um, I, I've made some changes in the last 
few months on on housing cases because I shared some some concerns around some cases not getting getting through um, and cases now that if they want an escalation from, from stage one to stage two there's a very clear uh, set of instructions that come straight through to to my team rather than going back to the to the stage one um, the stage one case officer so they will come straight through to 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 my stage two team now that said um, there are sometimes where there's a request for stage two but there will be a discussion around that it could be i want a stage two because you've not done one item actually if we can get that one item done then the resident's happy and there's no need for a, a stage two so sometimes there will be a discussion around around sort of the uh, sort of the case but obviously if there's clear dissatisfaction um, of stage one it will come to stage two and it will be investigated at, at stage two um around lack of customer um lack of customer care i share some of those um share some of those concerns um i'd like to think at stage two we show that that care and that empathy um we're in regular contact with the resident we we phone them we're when it needs and quite often it does we go and visit them and we'll come out and do those those site visits and see the see the problems um and that includes from the investigators through to through to myself where it's needed um and but at stage one it it varies service to service it's not consistent um i think some of those problems are due to a, a turnover of, of staff in some services um, but I can't say that uh, is that service that service that service as to what that is but there is there is that some of it is the volume undoubtedly at the moment um, with you've, you've got the same number of staff dealing with twice the volume that they dealt with um, two years ago and in some cases three times the volume that they dealt with two years ago so they haven't got time to spend on each case that they'd like to we've seen that at stage at stage two we're dealing with uh, going into this year we're dealing with three times the volume that we dealt with two um two years ago um the team are struggling they're at breaking point um and they would like to spend a hell of a lot more time dealing with with people but sometimes time is having to be limited because of the the volume of cases that they're um they're dealing with and, the, and these cases especially at stage two are normally incredibly complex and needed to involve lots of um lots of different people in, involved um it comes back to for me we need to get the base level service working reduce those numbers of complaints coming in and then people can have that that sense of a, a bit of sort of space to let's to, let's spend that time on um talking to people i where my stage two team would have gone out in previous times and trained and reinforced and whatever else over a course of a year with different people we haven't got the capacity to do that at the moment we are we are firefighting keeping on top of the the volume we're not being able to do do that that extra layer of assurance that we would have done previously as well so we would have done sampling and assurance of of stage ones we are we haven't got that that capacity at the moment Okay, thanks, Bruce. Have we got any more general questions at this stage, or should we move on to specific service areas? No? Should we move on to specific service areas? I think, obviously, um, we can start with housing repairs. Um, and welcome, Victoria. I know that you're quite new um, to your role as well, so very grateful for you coming um, to Scrutiny Panel. Um, and obviously, we, we realise that we're not going to be able to sort of um, in, um, you know, change everything overnight or answer everything. But um, thank you for coming, and will um, and anything you can do to assist us would be great. Thank you. So um, I think I'll stop moving over to the colleagues. Really, uh, you know, complaints, um, focused issues on housing repairs. Yeah. 
So, yeah, I mean, so as several people have acknowledged, really, there's been um, a really significant um, increase at more than seven percent in relation to housing repairs. I know that there's been a lot of work done across the service. There's obviously been the, um, you know, the progressive engagement as well. Um, so I suppose, really, I think my first question is, what have we, you know, learned from these complaints, and really, what is the plan to improve the services, if there's anything? I know, I know, this, we're focusing on still complaints, but what we learned the complaints in terms of service improvement. So I don't know who wants to start with that, Victoria or. Um... Hi. Um... Apologies, I'm pretty new to this this whole system and I'm just getting the grasp of everything. So I'll just give you everything from a more high level understanding. So currently what we're doing, we're, in, we're reviewing internal processes on how we handle complaints across the house and services team. We're not really focusing specifically on, you know, the repairs team, the building maintenance team. We're focusing on, on the whole on the whole service, really and really trying to drum in and having the right people in the room to understand how that's working internally within the various teams. Um, at this point, we're trying to identify what we can do in short term period and what we can do over the long term period um, and how we prioritise that work. Um, our aim is still the same to reduce the amount of complaints coming in um, and as well, um, discovering how we can reduce complaints going to stage two. Um, but that's all I can probably share at this very moment. We're still in the reviewing process and trying to identify things going on in the individual house and services and areas, but um, that's still going to take a bit of fleshing out to understand how that's working because obviously it's easy to to look at, you know, the central complaints management team and to see where things are going wrong, but the internal practices are hard to discover and to flesh out so we're in the process of doing that at this current point with the aim to understand what we intend to achieve by you know a, a, a six months period against a long-term period um and then we're going to reflect that with you know the various different teams and report to um, bruce's team to ensure that they are captured in that process that's all i can share at this point thank you um i think Please, we'll have follow-ups. Um, who was first? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you are in the Patrick, yeah, I have a go. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I think we all understand that complaints as a whole at the moment is under immense stress. But for me, in particular in regard to housing complaints, I, I, I do have a degree of worry um, in, 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 yeah, with regard to the kind of recent issues that I've had to kind of take up on behalf of residents. I'm not sure how joined up the services are in terms of the interaction with the delivery team and that kind of transfer of cross-pollination of information and whether that's something that's in the progress of being developed. And I think likewise in terms of record holding as well, I, 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 I'm sorry to bring it down to kind of minutiae. I dealt with the case last week. Two, two tenants in the same building. The responses that they received were cross responses. So responses were reflective of each other's case, all contained within one response. So I'm just trying to understand how things like that would happen and kind of the level of what kind of infrastructure that you have in place to kind of ensure that records are accurate. The information received from the kind of satellite departments is, is fed back directly to you as a point of contact, whether this is Part and part of the ongoing development of the service is what I'm trying to kind of gather at this stage to ensure kind of incidents such as that I kind of outlined don't happen anymore. Thank you. Victoria, do you to pick up the first bit? Um, <laughs> in terms of record management, um, the housing service do not have a, a housing management system, um, and that is a big big issue for them. Um, post cyber they're still they're still operating on numerous and I'm I'm sticking a finger in the air. I, I don't know the number, but it's it's in the tens of different 
systems it's, it's, it's 10 20 30 different systems that they're they're pulling together and putting different information from in order to in order to deliver the service and that is a massive issue for them uh, a massive practical issue um so that means that they are still operating really with one arm type back trying to deliver a service um for the complaints and members inquiries and all sort of casework we have a, a good casework management um system um but the underlying housing system is is an issue for people councillor patrick please um i'm interested in the lifts um protocol and the stage ones and stage two could you say that at the lift protocol is trying to be a big issue for residents uh the ineffective so i assume that means that um that no one came out and repaired their lift i mean i just wondered what the lift protocol is exactly and the you said the customer journey review has been established to drive for improvements so i'd like to know more actually what what the customer journey review uh, established and what the improvements were and have anybody got any data on whether they've been established and whether it's working because i know in the past that i've had to ring um emergency services and use the word counselor um several times where to try and get a lift in a tower block when both lifts were out and people were either stuck on the ground floor and not able to get back into their homes or people were stuck in their homes i mean i've got one resident in that particular tower block has missed numerous hospital appointments because they live on the 12th floor they can't get a transfer and the lift both lifts are off and out um so i'm not sure I'd be interested to know what's been learned and what the improvements are and whether we've monitored whether the, the improvements are working because it's unacceptable that residents are either stuck in their homes or can't get back. I mean, you know, people that live on the 12th floor, it's a, it's a lot of stairs to walk up. So I'd be interested in that. I mean, yeah, thank you. Right. Thanks. Um, Rhys, do you want to pick that one up or? Yeah, I will say it'd be one really councillor that I'd, I'll get um, sort of a senior manager in housing to come back to you um, on. I I haven't got the, the detail no. to hand. I can answer that, I'm afraid, but I'll get someone to come back to you on that one. Thank you. Um, now bringing Councillor Lynch, who thinks put her hand up. Oh, hi. Thank you, Chair. Hi, everybody. Good evening. Um, Bruce, my question is, I don't want to dwell on what's happened as a result of why we don't have a housing management system, but can I be assured and can those uh, present be assured that this is a strategic priority for the corporate management team? Um, I think for us, politically, this would probably be a high um priority for Cleon as the cabinet lead for this as well because given the, the the fact that there is such a huge amount of members inquiries around housing having some sort of uh you know uh effective housing management system where we can track all of this seems to be seems to be needed and, and if this is happening is there a timeline on when we might be able to have a a, 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 an effective housing management system in place again i don't want to dwell on what's happened why we're in this position i want to know what's being done to go forward with this so that we can have assurance for members and for our residents that we are going to be able to systematically and competently be able to manage what's coming down the what's what's needed to, to, to manage our housing stock effectively and our residents needs and just to add to that thanks very much for that helpful question councillor lynch just to add to that in the report there are a number of technological innovations in relation to tracking repairs but we're still in this really this position they don't really seem to have so far driven the change that we need so yeah i totally agree that we were certainly seeking reassurance that's a priority yeah um, i can obviously give you that reassurance totally it's it is a priority. Steve Waddington as the strategic director for housing has identified that and work is already well underway in terms of a, a procurement of that of that system. So it's it's well in train. There is one coming. Um and I sorry off the top of my head again because I haven't got the the detail not being a housing a housing person, I can't give you that that date, but I 
it is definitely work that is very much in in train map procurement is in full flow at the moment and one is one is coming Okay. Could I just ask then that, given the given the priority for this, that we we as members, I particularly know when it's going to come onto the the cabinet procurement committee as well, obviously because there was a process, isn't there as well of like the preferred provider? I guess that's what you're trying to say here, isn't it, Bruce? Is once yeah. we've just it has to come through. So uh, I'm sure we can be notified by the mayor's office or what have you when that's coming down, so that we've got that assurance. Yeah, if it needs to come through CPC, yes, it will depend upon the procurement and the style because obviously there's lots of different routes through um, for different procurements. So, yes, if it needs to come through CPC, obviously that will be on the agenda and you'll be informed. Thank you. Uh, now bring in Councillor Polway. Thank you, Chair. A bit of a follow up to, to the previous two questions about not having a housing management system and just just to clarify Bruce does this mean that we're not really able to do data analysis essentially because we can't we're not able to capture things in a way that would enable us to do this um because obviously uh, for many of us doing casework or even just me as a, as a social housing resident you know my block is persistently impacted by um upsurges which are so costly for the council to have to fix um the the results of you know sewage coming up through toilets through you know coming through sinks for the whole of the bottom floor of the block and it's it's gone on for as long as i've lived in that block for is there enough what can we do now because if we keep saying that we need to wait until we've got a housing management system is there no way that we're able to look at to do spot checks at the very least on blocks or even to ask for example like I think we use we like outsource i don't know we use like a, a drainage company that seems to come around and fix our drains whenever that happens can we not ask them how many times are we bringing you out and what are you doing are you are you at this same block 20 times in a year because if you are how much is that costing and do we need to knock on every residence door and do something else rather than getting you to do this work 20 times what can we do in lieu of having a housing management um system that would work for us it, yeah, thank you, Councillor Conway. It's not that we haven't got data, we've got data. It's just that that, that data is not joined or those systems aren't joined up. So we've got we've got all the information, we've got all the data. It's just in several different systems um, and not all in one place. So someone, if they're looking at a, a particular block or particular house or a particular property, might have to look on five or six different systems to get the full the full picture rather than going to one system and it all appear in in front of them so it just means life is more difficult it doesn't mean we can't do it and we it, we should be doing it and things like spot checks are are taking place so there's a number of a number of blocks and a number of things where we know that there's particular issues be that drains or whatever where they go through and they do regular jetting regular visits in terms of that prevention work um to make sure that we don't have those have those problems so if there's a particular blocks that you think need that and aren't getting that attention then please um, let myself or steve waddington know those and we'll investigate the the data and look at getting those on that on those programs <laughs> um no. Thank you. Um, I mean, I'm conscious of time um, on this item. I, I um, hope you understand our sort of concern really about housing repairs. Um, and, you know, I think we all agree about the prioritisation of case management system. And, you know, I think we're all looking for updates as soon as possible. Just to focus on a couple of other areas, um, there's been a significant increase um, at least obviously not numerically as big in relation to complaints about benefits and revenues um you know in relation to council tax i mean obviously this is a matter of significant concern as well because these you know represent potentially delays in people getting payments um and or you know being able to sort of deal with the um deal with the council i just wonder whether you've got any um learning or you know sort of response to that in relation to a strategy for changing that and i think um then we'll have a few more questions about other priority areas and then move on 
I can give you something, but given I think you've got Jackie in the room, I don't know if Jackie would be better. Yeah, okay. I'll put Jackie, yeah. Yeah, Jackie, 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 Jackie doesn't cover benefits. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I can certainly take, take questions away to my colleague. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, yeah. Um, Chat, yeah, so I, I, I can't really help immediately with but I'm obviously um uh Bruce Bruce is oh sorry yeah uh, I can't really uh help me on the data of the question earlier. Bruce of course is um you know done a fine job in trying to explain what the council's problems in these areas but really uh he's only the messenger aren't you you know you're, you've got this data through the system and that brings to a problem and I suggest I mean these are all really important issues that the commission, the the, the panel and commissions may want to take up in their work programs. Um, to speaking as the, the cabinet member is, who does cover the area of benefits, though not out of point. I mean, obviously, it, it, and customer services, it, it is an issue, um, and it is an increasing issue because of the the cost of living crisis and the the pressure that we put on. Um, as, as we, as you probably be aware, we've only recently started to, um, uh, I say recently, in the last six months or so, started to get chased uh, more actively council tax debts and other debts to the council as a result, get, you know, with the interregnum over, over the um, uh, lockdown period. So, yeah, it's been a challenge at the moment that we're doing all we can to try and address them and speed things up as fast as possible. And we're, we're actively looking at the interconnectivity between various systems to make sure communications are uh, all as smooth as possible as well. So we'll, come, we'll come back to that in more detail. I want to do that. Um, does need to be scrutinised more in part of the either mm -hmm. or in part of the other committee system. So just really checking with colleagues whether there are any other specific questions. Well, uh, Conway? The, do, about the other areas. I suppose I had a bit of a I'd initially raised it as a sorry that's not working. Okay. No, sorry. No. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I'm sorry, I'd initially raised it as a, a bit of a like a general question because I suppose I was a bit struck by one of the complaints that come in, in relation to um children's social care. Um just just as an example, I suppose, but one that sort of found that um fathers were not sufficiently involved in and consulted about child and family assessments, but also that um yeah, that we that we found that this was a bit of a, a an issue within the service. This feels, I suppose, this is why I mentioned about strategy because it makes me think that is this a far deeper oversight than is this not just a case of oh we we've realised that our existing systems are not picking this thing up, or is that because that's like quite that's quite a big issue within children's social care not including fathers in in these processes because. Um, I think it's like a well-documented challenge, but it's, I mean, what what greater learning are we able to take from these things at more of a, and I, I keep saying at more of a strategic level, but um, I know that it's supposed to, if we've made some changes to social work practice to ensure that fathers are better, that's like, a, it's like a cultural issue. The fact that we're only talking primarily to mothers about things and not involving fathers, this results in, you know, so how, how are we able to really think about weaving what we've learned from these things into any future strategies around the way that we're working with people so that it isn't just this remedial plaster to fix this particular issue but to really understand the cultural issues that might give rise to these sort of things thank you very yeah i mean I'm not wishing to um, avoid answering the question, but um, I will. In that the adults and children social care are our statutory processes, um, so not ones. Whilst we will pull the figures into this, is not ones that we we sort of deal with. Um, I would suggest um, a question out to the director of 
children's social care to to ask us the, these are ones that are going through to their their regulatory sort of bodies um so i would suggest sort of some questioning of of those those directors for those Thank you. Do we have any more questions? Okay, thank you very much, Brief. I know you've um, interrupted me to come here, so we're grateful for that. And, um, I just, um, you know, I think, I mean, obviously, we are concerned about the, the rise and volume of complaints. Um, we very much look forward to hearing about um, improved systems and improved use of technology. Um, I think there is some further investigation topic that was launched to the panel really about the use of data across the systems um you know across the council um you know also we've got more questions really about the total cost of this which i i think will um ask you sort of in writing i think we pick, pick that up um at the beginning um and really i think we're you know sort of looking for um progress really about um, I'd actually take your point about getting core services right, but we're we looking. But this is sort of a word of clock, really, that doesn't it? With the with what comes through your service with um, complaints, so we're really looking for as much learning as possible from here. Um, I think we probably sorry, Councillor Patrick. Just coming. Oh, it's just an observation, Chair. Um, sorry. <laughs> I was handing it out to Caps of Cornwall because I thought this wasn't working. It's just an observation. I mean, Bruce has done a very good job in answering the questions as he can. But obviously, he's not the person that implements the policies. Um, he's just responsible for collating the information and doing the follow-up. I think it would be really good when we have this back next time if we could have some of the strategic directors um here and perhaps the cabinet members um i would suggest perhaps housing being the main one because i, I, I most of most of our complaints um most of the complaints are housing and certainly most of the members inquiries i imagine are housing i mean if i mean so i'm in a world where a third of ours are goes from housing association we have we have two large estates ones managed by tmo so the complaints go there and one's managed by house association so the complaints don't come through to the council but um i imagine looking at the results looking at what we've got it's a lot of it's mostly housing apart from some some other so it'd be good i think if we could interrogate the directors um so that we could learn ask them directly what they're learning from the complaints and how they and what they what they're going to how they're going to mis mitigate them so i think next year the complaints should be up up even further certainly members inquiries from my inbox yeah no i, I agree with that i think it would be extremely helpful to have this um, strategic um, directors um, and especially yeah. as we're going to be reducing some services as well okay thank you very much um so Yes, yeah, so we'll now move on to the next agenda item. So the finance update. Um, so welcome to this item. Um Jackie Moylan um, and Dr. Chapman and also Councillor Anna Lynch, the Fair of Audit, who's going to be talking about the work of the audit committee. So now um I don't know whether you want to do an introduction, Councillor Chapman. Oh, very briefly, if yeah. it's all right. Um uh, I'll, I'll leave the, the detail to um Jackie Moylan to present because she's the director of finance, but um, obviously, I'm going to ask questions. But the, the, the just thing I wanted to say, obviously, a lot of the story here reflects the difficult financial pressures that the council are under. Um, uh, as has been said, I'm not sure you sure it's in these slides, but um, the net effect of uh, government action on uh, uh, external funding on the, on the count for the council since 210 has meant that, that we're in a situation where uh, 150 million pounds a year worth off now than we were in 210. And that's an incredible pressure, which reflects both on the uh, we'll go through the forecast for the current year uh, and in the difficulties we're facing for the budget uh, process over 24 25. Um, and that, I think, underlines quite a lot of the messages that, that are in 
are in here. Um, it's a important bit of stress in that because obviously Jackie is officer can't really. And that's but that blunt way that you know it's government actions but it's in such a difficult position anyway thank you thank you brilliant thank you so i'll share a, a slide pack um probably the density of this um slide pack um with quite a lot to cover um oops, Should be coming up on the screen there. This is where I panicked. It's the wrong slide pack, but it looks like it was the right one. You've got so many, haven't you? So many, so Brilliant. Thank you. So um, it's quite a, a long presentation. I'll skip through it as far as I can. I'm conscious, conscious of time. So I'm going to talk, talk very briefly about the, the forecast for the current year, both general fund and the HRA, and then look at the, the London plan for the um, general fund in particular, the pressures that have been experienced across, across London as as Councillor Chapman said, it's not a position unique to us, although we are feeling quite quite um, significant at the moment. Very briefly, we'll talk about the capital program. You've got the, the, the capital update before the senior pack. An update on the budget process for 24 to 26, 27, um, and then also a very quick run through on the budget comms and also the audit, audit state and the impact of that, which, which obviously we had a couple of weeks ago. I will turn very briefly to the public interest reports of section 114 notices, noting that there's a deep, detailed report that's going to audit committee in, in January following the deep dive in that area. And then I can con conclude with, um, with Councillor Lynch in relation to the income generation task and finish group. It was in, in, in the papers tonight, we referred to the as a fees and, fees and charges task and finish group. So, um, firstly, then, so this was a position that was presented at the October cabinet, the forecast in a a 9.3 million pound overspend so that was that was um <clears throat> mainly attributed to the areas that we've been increasingly reporting on which includes adult social care children education F fmcr so primarily benefits and revenue and that's associated with additional staff working on debt recovery i think council chapman mentioned earlier that he stepped up debt recovery processes following the um the, the um the cyber attack and the impact of COVID on, on debt, debt collection, plus in terms of the manual process, which is still in place in relation to, to benefits where we need, need to, to, in, to have additional staff on, on board. Uh, I think it's fair to say that the, the, the pressures, probably with the exception of the Chief Exec's Department, actually, are across, across, the, um, across the Council. We're also seeing some pressures in climate, home economy, particularly in relation to environmental operations. Further to, to what's set out in, in the forecast, we've also got an additional pressure in relation to the 23 24 pay award, which was considerably more than, than, than is budgeted. In, in terms of this year, we're meeting it from one off reserves, which we set, us, we set aside because we recognise there was a risk in that process. But it does need to be factored in on an ongoing basis for 24, 25, and, and the years beyond. It's also worth emphasising there still remains uncertainty about the, the dedicated score, right? High needs funding. And what, what we're going to do, how we're allowed to deal with any, de any deficit code post 25 26. In terms of the, the, the London picture, so um, the Society of London Treasurers and London Council recently, recently undertook a, a survey in relation to what the overspends were as at quarter three for, for quarter two, sorry, for 23 24. Uh, the, the, the total general fund gross pressure across London was reported at 610 million. Which is a, which is a considerable increase from what was reported in quarter one, which is 392 million. The largest spend pressures were in adult social care and children's social care, but also in temporary accommodation. Mm -hmm. So, in terms of that, I would say that although the monitoring period we're doing at the moment, we've seen an increase in spend in that area. That is an area where we, we, we haven't seen as much as a pressure as some other boroughs are seeing. I think, I, I sort of think we've is coming through it hasn't come through yet in terms of the numbers in in the borough but i think we've partly helped to mitigate that by trying to take hold of our supply a little bit so we've got more hostels than most other london boroughs and we've been trying to keep the unit costs down by increasing our supply but i do think that that is going to be one that's going to come through towards the end of this year and also significantly for, for next year it's worth mentioning that mentioning that 13 boroughs are reported no spend of over 20 billion with an average overspend of 15.8 million or 6, 6 million of their budget. 
So there's, there's a, a stream, a lot of use of reserves to so go in to mitigate those overspends, as there is in, in Hackney as well. I think the rule forecast we're probably using 14 to 20 million of reserves in the current financial year to make the both the cost coming through and that additional pressure in relation to the power bill. The average remaining net pressure from London boroughs after use of reserves, etc., is around eight million, which is which is three percent of budgets. And again, I think we're more or less in line with that. That doesn't give us much comfort, really. But um, it is, it's just to let you know, it's it's a common occurrence across the across the um, across the across London. It's worth noting that the pressures, general fund pressures, increased by over fifty percent since quarter one, with nineteen local authorities reporting increase in financial increase in financial pressures since quarter one. So it really is quite a, quite a bleak picture across London. In terms of housing revenue account position, so we're forecasting on budget, but that's after a planned draw drawdown of reserves to break even 23, 24. And that's that's linked to the fact that we were phasing in the increase in the council's district heat networks over the two years. So the increase in pricing has been phased in over two years, which meant we plan to draw down a million pound reserves, and that's what we're doing. In terms of the forecast and break even position, but beneath that, there's, there's unders and overs, so very variances in terms of rental income and variance in terms of expenditure which is set out on the slide in terms of the um the main the main risk going forward there is obviously risk around energy prices going forward also the 23 24 payroll also affects the the hra and that will be factored into the the upcoming forecast council's capital program so in the fact that you would receive tonight there's the the october cabinet capital update report and that's showing a current year forecast around 250 billion in relation to our capital program i'll be very surprised if it's at that level because we do experience a considerable amount of slippage so that's where where um effectively potentially issues like tenants coming back above the estimates etc the need for work further work on viability the ongoing delay sometimes in procurement of main of, of some of our main providers and also um, issues around housing asset management works plus other external factors. For example, you sometimes can get slippage slip as a result of a, of a planning decision, as a result of um, uh, a, even a governmental intervention, government government decision, and decision to lay a uh, capital spend. As, as I say, I think we, we do still have an optimism bias in terms of our capital program. We do try and challenge that when we're looking at the budget setting. But it's worth mentioning that although we might um, spend less this year, we're not saying we're going to spend less overall in the capital programme. It really is those budget slips for the following year. So it's just a slight delay in, delay in delivery and when we spend that money. In terms of borrowing, we have undertake, undertaken no new borrowing in, in, in the current financial year. So effectively, we're able to manage our capital programme through internal borrowing. That doesn't mean it doesn't have an impact on our revenue budget, budgets. It does. So because whether you borrow from your internal cash balances or from external, you still have to set aside money to repay that debt. So in terms of, sort of increase in, in interest rates, obviously that has an impact on us, and that's largely largely um, sort of driven by yields of the long-term government bonds. So where they increase, we tend to have an increase in our in interest rates and vice versa. But as I said, so far this year, we've undertaken no new borrowing. In terms of budget update for 24, 25, 26, 27, and members recall, we started the year with an estimated budget, budget gap of 22 million. 24 25 and for 57 million across the three year period um we've had a um, considerable progress has been made in terms of balance in the budget for 24 25 but more work needs to be done particularly for 25 26 and 26 27 with difficult decisions needing to be made as as they are across many local authorities and i think i think Councillor chapman has referred to that in his introduction so in terms of budget proposals we had an initial set of budget proposals we agreed by cabinet in july and that included uh, income in relation to commercial estates and also parking income as we move forward with the parking enforcement plan. And we've got further budget proposals which have been or are going to scrutiny budget commissions in the next couple of weeks, and they will be brought forward to Cabinet in December and in January. So that will move us on significantly in terms of balancing the budget for 24-25, but as I said, a still considerable gap for 25-26-26-27. The proposals in themselves individually will be some, some of those if, if they're deemed uh, it's deemed relevant will be subject to equal equality impact assessments particularly where there's an impact on services or, or on staff 
but also overall we undertake a cumulative impact assessment across all the budget proposals. So once we've got to January, we've got all those budget proposals in and agreed, a cumulative impact assessment will be undertaken. It's worth saying that the final position for 24 25 will not be here until we receive the provisional local government settlement. And as always, we don't expect that until the week before Christmas, which isn't very helpful, really, but, but that's that's the way it's been for the last um, several years, really. We, we expect that in two weeks' time. And then following that settlement, what we'll be doing is updating the medium term financial plan and extending the period for another year. So we'll be looking out to 27, 28 and updating that budget gap as part of the, part of the budget report. So in terms of budget comms, which I think I was asked to cover tonight, so the, the Council's comms team have launched a resident focused consultation to inform longer term budget setting processes. And what that, aim, that campaign aims to do is improve residents' understanding of the budget position of the, of the Council in terms of um, the pressures we are under, in terms of how we are funded, and in terms of the challenges the Council faces. So it's all within that overall overall. Um, communication strategy around the, just some of the decisions that the council might need to make in the future or will we need to make in the future. Um, in terms of the results, we, the survey was completed by 149 residents and we are using those results to help shape our approach and priorities in relation to budget comms. Um, it's worth, worth saying that, that, that in terms of um, the feedback we got, there was a, there was, there was a good understanding of the work of the council, but less of understanding of how we are funded. Basically. I don't think that's surprising, really, because local authority funding system isn't straightforward, and I don't think it really would be expect a residents to have a full understanding of that, but it's something we want to try and work on, because that gives the context in terms of uh, some of the difficult decisions we have to make. And as part of the, of the campaign, we always use uh, Love Hackney, so we always use that to, to, to give to um, distribute to all our residents uh, an overview of the budget and the budget proposals and also the how the budget is made up. So what we spend on individual and different services. And it's in that sort of communication where it becomes clear that a large portion of the budget is spent on children's and adult services really, that in, in terms of general funding and much less on those universal services that all our residents, residents see. Mm. So moving on to the um, autumn statement, as it was. So first of all, it's worth saying that the statement was really disappointed in terms of the local government. There was actually very little mention of local government in it. There was no, no, no additional funding announced for adult social care or children's services, although there was an additional 120 million um, announced for homelessness prevention grant. But as I think I showed in the previous slide, the, the forecast across London is already more than 120 million in terms of the pressure, so that's not going to go very far. We haven't got the individual updates in relation to that yet, so we don't know how much will that will come into happening, uh, but we should hope we should know in the next few weeks. The other thing that the autumn statement announced was that the council, sorry, not council tax, business rates will be fro frozen for smaller businesses, but be increased in line with inflation for, for those larger businesses. So those businesses with a rateable value of over £51,000. They also extended the retail, hospitality and leisure business rate relief, so that's 75% relief of bills for another year. In terms of the impact on the council of that, we get funding for that. So if where we lose lose business rates, we get compensated that for, by that for that through grant. There was also an announcement around um, an allowance for local authorities to be able to cover the full cost of planning for major applications. But are very much a link towards us ensuring that we complete those applications on in time. So effectively, I think if, if residents put an application, also a major application, it's not completed in time, they can recover that that fee. So it's a bit of a double-edged sword, really. We need to see how that how that plays out through and how that how that's modelled. So there's no, there's no information on local government spending totals post 24-25, so very little information about what we're going to get in terms of external funding for 25-26 and, and going forward. I think that probably as expected given the, um, sort of the, the um, lead up to the election, but it did say that government, the Department of Budgets will increase by 1% in real terms over the medium terms at 28-29. But that really implies a, a, a real terms cut for unprotected departments, of which local government is one. So in previous years, when there's been slight real terms increases, that hasn't, hasn't translated into, into local government increases. There was an increase in the local, local housing allowance rate, which, which, which um, benefits um, 
people in private sector accommodation on benefits so that they're able to claim a, a higher proportion of, of market rent for the, through their housing benefits. It doesn't have an impact on us other than in, in terms of temporary accommodation, it might help us move um, um, residents who are in temporary accommodation through to private sector lettings because they are slightly more affordable. But I think in that there's likely to be a time lag so before it has an impact on our finance, but that's sort of good news for some of our residents. A third round of funding for create 54 and a 50 million for local authority housing fund was announced. And that was to deliver new housing units and in for temporary accommodation. It's worth noting that this is an area where we've been quite successful in bidding against in the previous previous um, round. So I'm sure we'll look to be doing that again to maximise and maximise what we can do in that space going forward. Uh, the forecast that she can transfer tax receipt. Receipts will increase by 5% in 24 25 and similar levels in, 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 in the following years. So, that, what that sort of suggests is that, that the government is still um, relying on increases in council tax, both in council tax levels, but also in the properties which, on which we levy a council tax in order to increase our income going forward. There was announced a £3 billion increase in, in investment into affordable homes guarantee scheme. Please don't ask me any detailed questions about that one because I'd have to come back to you. Mm -hmm. Uh, and probably worth mentioning, it's not on that, that slide, is, is, the, is the confusion over the household support fund. So it, it seems to be clear in the statement that um, the household support fund for which Hackney got 5.6 million for the current financial year um, to, to, to support um, families in, in, in the borough, it's clear from the statement that that wasn't going to continue, but then a question on the floor of the house suggested it might do. And the feedback we've had since then is that there's still time and there might be an announcement in March, but certainly you can't guarantee it. I think it's very, very high risk to sort of to rely on that for, for 2024, 25. It's just well, that's a real blow to our, you know, our, the, the way we've been supporting um, families over the cost of living crisis. Mm -hmm. No, sorry to interrupt. No, no problem. So in terms of the next few slides, I'm looking at section one one four notices. So this is sort of an area that's been in the in the press up in a lot in recent months, and it seems to be ramping up in recent weeks as well. So just to, to give, give give scrutiny a sort of a, a background of what the section one one four notice is and, and when when a section one five one officer might issue one. And it's also worth noting that um as I said previously, that all the committee are doing a deep dive in the public interest report section one one four area, which we reported in detail in, in January. So, um, first, it's worth emphasising that local authorities cannot go bankrupt. What they do is they issue a 114 notice. So, they use, these used to be really rare. I think years ago, Hackney was the first one. In, um, Brilliant. Brilliant. It's not as a competition, but that they, they're historically um, very rare. So, this this is a report from the council's chief finance officer, i.e., section 151 officer. That they believe that the authority is about to incur unlawful expenditure. So that could be that could be for a number of reasons, but primarily it's, they've been issued as, as they've expected. Section one five one officers expected that expenditure was going to ex exceed resources. So that's the the areas in which you would have seen in the press. So once the section one one four notice is issued, that the authority cannot incur any new spending unless the finance officer permits it. And that is for statutory services, or will prevent the, the situation escalating. So, if it's expenditure, it's going to help them turn around, turn around the position that, that could potentially be allowed. But it cannot make the position any worse. And, and, all, and also, it's worth noting that the council itself must meet the 21 days to discuss how to bring their expenditure in line with funding. And elected members and officers, as well as central government, will examine options to balance their budget for the year. So it does sort of trigger quite a lot of intervention involvement from, from, from government and other officials. And actually, and if you get that in, in, in intervention and involvement, you have to pay, you have to pay for it as well. So it sort of adds to the as adds to the budget pressure. Um, while there are some technical issues on the HRA and, and the legal expenditure for some areas. Generally, the reasons that Section 114 notice have been issued is, is due to sort of very significant sort of um, corporate bu bu budget failure. And it tends to be around um, authorities that have taken really big risks of, of really diff different and unusual commercial decisions, as opposed to sort of run of the mill sort of budget management, ma management and budget to succeed on um, expenditure exceeding budgets. Um, Northamptonshire was the first council issue Section 114 in the modern area, so, so post Brent. And um, 
<clears throat> and it was nearest to what could be described as a normal bay. There were governance and leadership failed to make savings, raise taxes or see risks in time. So that was more of a normal type of failure. And then most, most, one of the most recent ones is around Birmingham City Council. And this sort of immediate trigger of, of their section 114 notice was the crystallisation in June of, of nearly three quarters of billion in liability in relation to an equal pay settlement and the unexpectedly high information cost implementation costs of an ICP project. And I say crystallisation there because I, I assume they must have been in some way aware of, that, aware of that as it was leading up to that 114 notice. But as I've said, said previously, with the others, we have seen quite normal events where, of course, there have been significant impact by commercial decisions, backed by very significant debt. So one of the things that we've found is some authorities have, have taken on debt which far exceeds their, their, their turnover, which is obviously a big risk for the council. In terms of themes that have merged from those public interest reports, which often precede or follow section 114 notice, they've included Government culture, internal relationships, so that's, that's, that's around sort of inappropriate member involvement, potentially, um, in some instances, sort of um, a failure to, to recall decisions, the rationale for decision, decisions, failure to manage risks associated with, with companies and, and company ownerships, that's sort of optimism bias in terms of um, what we expect to get from commercial adventures, etc. A lack of scenario planning, sort of assuming that, that the grass is. Um, the sun is always going to be shining when it might not be so obviously things like covid period would have impacted on some of those those commercial investment made made by some authorities and in, in i suppose one of the things as well is in, in terms of the um sort of capacity of the councils as councils have, have faced ongoing cuts they've looked to reduce their their budgets often they turn to the what the support services and the corporate core so finance and legal etc which in some instances has left them with lack of capacity and a lot of skills that in, in the in the authority but it's also worth mentioning that, that also it's, it's sometimes around officers not taking external external advice not recognizing when they might not necessarily have the right skills to to assess a proposal and and, and sort of go and move forward regardless again of some kind of optimism, optimism bias and there's also mentioned around audit committee effectiveness so audit audit has been not holding a Officers to account, not not seeking to, to background to, to decisions made, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And that moves us neatly onto the fact that the audit committee has recently undertaken a deep dive into public interest reports. And as I mentioned previously, this is due, due to be reported back to committee in January, and it looks at it looks at how Hackley sits in relation to some of those those sort of core core weaknesses which, which were mentioned also areas for improvement too i think it's worth mentioning here because obviously we're going to get the report in january but in terms of those sort of commercial risks commercial companies etc that's not something that the council has, has had a significant um, um, involvement in so you, you'll see when it comes out in the uh, in the audit committee report but there's 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 areas we can improve i think there always is but there's um areas where we we, we operate good practice too I think it's worth emphasising that, that I think there's a common understanding and a common acceptance, actually, we're moving into a space now that more Section 114 notices might be issued because of things like adult social care and children's social care, temporary accommodation, and it's because the costs are escalating so much that some authorities cannot balance their budget. Um, I've been talking to colleagues that have, um, they take that, that various spends take up such a great, great portion of their budget, even if there was to cut all the rest of their services, it wouldn't balance their budget in, in, in the medium and longer term. So, really, are we moving to that space potentially where there'll be more sort of section 114 notices issued because of, because of um, those sort of systemic issues rather than the, the one off big commercial risk take type, risk taking type venture? Moving on to the income generation task and finish group. Um, Sorry. Janky, um, I think it probably would be helpful. Maybe if we just um, had a round of questions yeah, focused focus on your report um, and then moved on to um, to the income generation and council yeah. Lynch's um, comments on that. So I think they're sort of slightly different issues. I've got, I, if I may, I'm going to, I'm going to um, start off with um, a few questions. Um, so if I understood correctly, you mentioned earlier in your report in relation to using um, reserves, and I've got the figure of 14 million. Um, can you tell us um, how we got into that position and, you know, um, give us any sort of information about the remaining reserves? 
Um, and then my second question really is in relation to the remaining budget gap. Obviously, we don't know what the financial settlement is, but whether you can tell us, you know, give us a figure on that, that would be really helpful. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll stick with those two at first. They're, they're quite good ones. <laughs> okay, so. In terms, of, in terms of the use of reserves, so yes, 14 million, that, and that's uh, that's largely driven by the escalation of the use of children's social care in adult and adult social care, but also some planned use of reserves. So that is, whether we'll be expecting to, to use reserve this year, and that would include areas like grant, which we have received in the past, and the etc. So yes, so we will see a dip in. We are expected to dip to a dip in reserves this year. In terms of, sort of going forward, how that impacts, what, what we, we have built into the budget for next year, significantly more growth than we had previous year. So we've got significant growth in relation to adults and children's next year. There's also growth built in relation to areas such as um, uh, environmental ops, et cetera. So, we, so going forward, we've built in growth, which would, would, which would cover the um, overspend this year. But I would, what I would say is the risk that's going to go up even further. So I'm not going to say that they're not going to be using reserves next year. And one of the things we, what we are doing is, um, we, as you, you, you might recall, we did a deep dive into, audit, into reserves as part of the audit committee's um, programme as well. And that showed you that sort of ongoing decline in reserves. Um, I think it's, it's an area that's happening across London, across the country, actually, that, that reliance on reserves. But we are updating that piece of work. So once we get the local government finance settlement, as I said, just before Christmas, we will be, we'll be updating that piece of work. So looking at where we are in terms of the uh, reserves or the forecast to be at the end of this year. And we'll also be looking at sort of stress testing our reserves in terms of what we've included in, in the budget for next year as well to give us um, an indication of our, our financial resilience and that's sort of something that we'll be doing early in the new year. In terms of the budget gap, um, we are, I'm not going to go, I'm not, can't really say that the final figure we get this yet because there's obviously th there's reports to go through to cabinet over the next couple of months which will, which will set that out and also we have to remember that we can't Obviously, the final decision in relation to the council tax isn't taken until the end of February as well. So, obviously, that 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 depends on members' um, um, council's uh, decision. But in in terms of where we are, well, I think we're in a relatively good position in terms of balance the budget for 24, 25. Um, obviously, it, that is dependent on the settlement, and we can't say. Um, Finally, that all those proposals we brought forward will balance the budget for next year because it, there could be a change in the settlement. I think we've made really good progress. And when I speak to my colleagues across London, I think we're in a good place. But um, that's not to say that doesn't involve difficult decisions. And certainly, so we're going forward into five, six, and six, seven, even more difficult decisions. Um, are you able to, just to follow up, are you able to satisfy us that we have an appropriate level of reserves? Um, to deal with any contingencies that we might face as a council. We, as part of the budget report, I actually have to make a statement in relation to, to, to the reserves to the council. And if you don't mind, I don't mind reserving that to, the, to that report. We have got a relatively reasonable level of reserves. Um, I think most most councils are finding that, that they are going down. We are not. We, we are. We, we are like most councils. It's not. You know, obviously, the reserves are one up once they've gone. They're gone. And of course, we've got an overspend of nine million this year. <laughs> okay, um, thank you. I'll just bring in Councillor Hayhurst then. I think oh, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thanks, Chair. So, can I just, just drill down to this nine million? I mean, previously, when we've had overspends, as I understand it, it's been somewhat mitigated by both the fact that within the budget we've put a certain amount aside to go into the reserves firstly and then secondly um the, the way we've set the counter tax base has been at a slightly conservative level and then we've we, we've taken in greater income um through council tax and those two factors and perhaps others that i'm not articulating have often mitigated some or all of the overspend so i'm just trying to get a core understanding of once those two factors those mitigating measures have been taken into account where does that take the nine million um overspend to so in reality how how much w worse off are we compared to than we were last year in real terms 
um just just so we get some sort of understanding and also in terms of the because of course another analysis is we've drawn 14 million down there's only a 9 million overspend but then you say you're planning to withdraw some of the reserves down so i'm just trying to get, understand that picture and also does that 14 million also include notion a, a notional packaging of an amount of money for the send overspend which is a continual occurrence now but can you just think i've got there are some other specific questions but i'd rather just get a grip of the overall position yes yeah, so so in, in the um in the uh forecast we have not we've not utilized as you mentioned previously we've not utilized uh, the contingency amount that we've got in there we all which we already always hold in the in the budget um, in terms of other areas where we, you mentioned the council tax and particularly around the, the council tax page, what, what we're finding this year actually is that what, what we're likely to be able to utilise to help us with that position is, is we're part of a, a localised NNDR pool. Um, and what that can do, that, that, that can accrue a surplus to the council. We don't, we, because there's a level of uncertainty around that surplus, we don't factor that into the budget. So that effectively comes back to us and we can accrue that to help us with, with the nine million position. Um, I would, I'd be, I would, I'd be lying to you if I said I think we could cover, cover the whole nine million. I think there will be an additional, um, potentially additional drawdown from reserve you know, on top of the 40 million or 14 million already there. There are, there are other areas where we can go to. We can look at how we're funding the capital program because we always include a, a certain element in the budget for funding the capital program as well. So we, we'll take that decision at, at the year end in terms of what's the best way to fund, fund that nine million. So there are things there, but not to cover the whole nine million. And 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 so then, Jackie. So just just so I get so just so I get in real terms, how much of a diminution? in real terms there are of the reserves and i understand the point that the reserves are allocated for different categories but can you give us in what sort of percentage reduction and i appreciate i don't know you know whether you actually can give us the real figures in this meeting or not just so we have just some oversight and understanding what is the real term likely diminution of reserves because obviously there are mitigating measures that you can draw upon there so are we talking about a fairly small but you know a one or two percent diminution in terms of reserves or are we talking about a much bit once you've taken into account all those factors or are we talk, talking about a much more substantial reduction in reserves are you talking on top of the 14 million cancer or in totality well i'm trying to still understand but that 14 yeah, million so, so presumably is mitigated by some of the matters that you've indicated so it is it, 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 in re real terms if in crude terms if we had 100 million in reserves at the start of the financial year but because of all the mitigation measures you've put in place okay we've got to use 14 but some of that comes back are we only actually at 98 million at the end of this year what is the real term wash through of the reserve position so what we had what we had at the end of the year was around I'm, tr I'm trying I'm, I'm, I'm saying this from from memory now it was around 150 and um, so so that is quite significant um sort of run, run through of our reserves I would say but as, as I said previously as well what we need to do is once we get the local government finance settlement in we'll look at that again and once we, and the other thing we have to look at as well is we need to work through so what we're, we're doing is working for our reserves in terms of actually what's there for a specific purpose in terms of, sort of capital spend etc and we've got set aside in capital spend what we've, what we've got there to mitigate things like this risks like this um in order to, 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 to make a balance our budget in here but can i can i suggest that i do bring something back in it, it once we it might be best to bring that back more formularized once we've had had those discussions with with um council chapman as well yes i mean yeah, yeah. Please, I mean, in, in reality, is because if, if we were at 150 and we've used 14, but we claw back eight, nine of those because of reduced capital spend and yeah, yeah. Counter, counter tax, then in reality, that gives us some idea. And, and in a way, that's obviously concerning for all the reasons you outlined, but it's not as concerning because in, in comparative terms, it's a fairly, you know, it's it's a smallish chunk and, and we can sort of understand where we are better. So it's really just a big... With, I'm not, you know, with the number of local authorities now going to the wall, I think, I think, you know, I think I just really want to just be a little bit more on top in terms of what is the real, real position in terms of when we're given these figures, what it actually means in real term at year end. And I think we need to know because we we have responsibility here just having some oversight and being on top of that. Yeah, so I, 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 I
Can I can I say what um as we are on public? I know you are, but I just want to make sure that we're clear uh, what we'll share with, with um sort of various colleagues before we, we sort of bring bring it to the screen. It, and also one of the things I really want to do is that there's that I want to do some sensitivity analysis on the reserves as well, because obviously we've made assumptions in the budget for next year around sort of growth and about impressions in certain areas. If those assumptions prove to be underweighted, etc., that's going to burn for our reserves quicker. So really, I, I want to do that sort of more detailed piece of work, um, so everybody understands the position in, it, we're in, and then then we bring that back here. That that if that would help. No, it would, and I know you're on top of it. It's just I think increasingly with a number of local authorities facing difficulty, I think I I feel personally there's a great responsibility on us just to just to understand it in very real terms. Absolutely, yeah. and I and I just want to do that, and you know, and I, I and I also we all have to understand there are a whole level of assumptions underpinning everything here, and you know we're not going to beat you you over you know for, for things like that, but I just want to have the best understanding that we that we can have on it. Yeah, no, thank you very much, Councillor Haycurst. Yeah, and I think it will be really helpful if we, yeah, um, I just bring Councillor Chapman. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it's an essential part of our oversight function that we do have, um, you know, understanding of these issues. Just bringing Councillor Chapman, I haven't forgotten you, Councillor Jarre. Thank you, yeah. Just a little bit about reserves in general terms. And, and I know Councillor Haycurst has a pretty sophisticated understanding of it as do the members of this, this body. Um, but uh, it's just worth saying that the, the myth that there is, uh, you know, a source of finance in the reserves, it, you know, it's got to be dispelled, really. Um, you know, they're all there for a specific reason or in the general reserve as a balance. If you do dip into it, you know, you can only do that once. It can just meet your problem. It can't finance ongoing expenditure. And you also have to put it back again, otherwise you're in a very exposed position. So it's not, you know, it's, it's just a way of getting, it's an insurance way of insurance, really, self-insurance. You could look at it in a funny sort of way, couldn't you? You're getting you out of problems. Uh, it's not, a, it, it, it can't be a way of finance and expenditure. And so that obviously is important that we are transparent about how we, you know, those calculations and how we, how, how, what we've gotten for why, which is why we went through that, um, deep dive last year and you know we're, as Jackie has said there we'll update update you and the appropriate bodies as, as we come to make the you know the final position on it later in the year yeah. or soon actually isn't it right thanks very much Councillor Chapman and I'll bring you Councillor Jory and that's another short question it's just a speaking of point of clarification um with regard to the capital program mm -hmm. so no borrowing this year 250.5 million allocated to it. I'm just trying to, given I've the first given Councillor Chapman, I'm just trying to determine the percentage of that which relates to external borrowing, uh, particularly with regard to rising interest rates and so forth. So, just to give you a little bit of update on that. So, when I say there's no external borrowing, the council's borrowing has been external borrowing has been about 70 million for for, for quite a number of years. We haven't taken out external borrowing for for quite a number of years, and that's because effectively with the timing of our cash flow. So, for example, we'll get our government grants in advance when we need them. We've also we've got reserves that we're holding for specific purposes, um, reserves that we're holding specific schemes, things like right to buy receipts, capital receipts, which can only be used on capital. So what we do is we, we before we go out and externally borrow, because as you mentioned, that's going to have an impact on us in terms of interest rates, we borrow against those cash balances. But what, what we have to remember is that one day we'll need those cash balances. So when we need those cash balances, we will have to externally borrow. So what we have to do in our revenue account is set aside an amount to repay that borrowing because eventually we'll, we'll, we'll have to do that. And one of the things we've been working on with um, the cabinet, cabinet members as well is around developing a longer term capital program, because obviously if you make a decision now on a capital scheme, because that expenditure is going to last 50 years, effectively it can have an impact on your budget for 50 years, 50 years time. So we're looking at, not 50 years I might say, but we're looking at extending our capital program to an indicative 10 year capital program. So we've got a much better sort of forward look on, on the impact of, on our revenue budget of, of capital. The 250 million figure you mentioned is, is a potentially the total capital program for the year. So that would be um, potentially, some would be externally borrowed or internally borrowed, uh, as, as I've just mentioned, but some of it will be funded by capital receipts. 
some of it will be funded by revenue contribution to capital. So, for example, on the uh, in, in terms of the HRA, um, some of the uh, the investment in sort of ongoing majors is from re revenue contribution to capital, and also from depreciation we've set aside for for those uh, for those works. I know that's quite a complicated long answer to your question, but it is a sort of comp quite a complicated area. And again, that's a it's worth mentioning that's another area which we all the into are due to the deep dive in terms of the capital cost, etc. Do you have fun? No, so, oh, yeah, I just wanted to, that to be a breakdown. Is, is that what's going to happen in order to well, just to see it? Yeah, the numbers. So, if you want to see the breakdown, there's a breakdown in the annual budget report of the capital program in terms of uh, what, what the money has been spent on but so there's a whole schedule of all the projects which the money has been spent on and there's also a breakdown in the, in the budget report of, of how it is funded so what is funded from borrowing what okay. is funded for company receipts etc okay so percentage wise can you say what is funded from borrowing Centralized. not off the top of the Thanks. I'll bring in councillor Haycurst that was any other questions think but we can move on um Thank you. Two, two, two very specific ones. Then, on, on the Hackney Central levelling up money, it obviously needs to be draw, brought down in very tight timescales. I mean, I, I have yet to see any work on the ground, but I mean, it's, it's right that we're we're going to bring down almost what two point six or one point nine million before April. I mean, that's incredibly tight. So I was just wondering if you can give any sort of um, update on what, what we're going to see there. I see Mete just raised his hand. And secondly, just talking about big project risks, Jackie, the, 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 the Tesco site, seeing as the option agreement, as I understand it, came to an end, can you just assure us that the, the, the presumably the interest or internal borrowing we're doing on that initial cost is being covered by the rent we're getting from Tesco or elsewhere? And so we're not losing on that in the short, medium term. Yeah, Jackie, yeah, and I'll be in Councillor Coburn. Yeah. So, do you want me so, to come in first? Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Do you want to go first, Councillor Coburn? Don't mind. Uh, yeah, I mean, so Professor, sorry, I, I am going to try to sort out my webcam. So apologies, I'm not on camera. Um, just to Councillor Hay has this question around the um, the Hackney Central uh, Living Up Fund. Um, as you know, ten million of that roughly is around ring fence for the Amos Road Pembury Circus um, scheme that we, um, I know you passionately have been advocating for as well. Um, and I think we'll be bringing a paper forward to cabinet, uh, which will outline designs uh, in December. And we would hope that very rapidly you'll start to see works being carried out from, from next year. So, um, you know, I can't say much more about the detail until the cabinet papers are um, announced and published, but that will be coming forward. Uh, in sort of the December timeline, and hopefully the works will start next year. I understand that it's going to be um, it's going to be on the agenda of the future meeting of the Skills Economy and Growth Commission. So there's a bit more information there. Thank you, and I, I can speak to Councillor Caven about it as well. And so then I think that answers that point. Then Dan, it's just the the Tesco site. Is that still washing its face in crude terms? So, so in terms of in terms of the Tesco site, so the, we, we do hold um, some income that we received on the balance sheet in relation to Tesco's. So that 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 is on the balance sheet, and that's that that for the most part is not it's not committed. And you'll see that in the in the statement of accounts. Actually, in terms of the the, the, the obviously the initial capital outlay, which was which was which was quite significant because it is effectively a, a um, sort of commercial type investment. We do have to make provision for that in our in our budget. So so that is already factored into our medium term financial plan. But what we would look to do is is, is is to bring forward a further proposal into that in sorry on, on that side. We'll be looking to sort of try to reduce that impact. But it is factored in, into our medium term financial plan. In in terms of um, the next steps on on on, on the Morning Lane site. I do not think there's anything in the public domain on that at the moment, Councillor Hayhurst, but I can go back and check what is in the public domain and come back to you if that would be helpful. No, that's fine, but it's more just, is it, so in other words, if I've got it right, the options agreement was covering the cost of the internal borrowing that we had to account for. That's come to an end. We did take, we did carry forward some money from it, but at the moment, the, the revenue that we're getting from Tesco on the site, what isn't covering the notional borrowing we're having to, that we have to allocate for it or 
or is it covering it off? It would have covered it up to this point, um, Council, Council Hayhurst, but sort of going forward, obviously, it's that, that there's a limit to that. And, but, and, obviously, and in terms of what we're setting aside in, 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 in the revenue budget in relation to, to, to the acquisition, that, that is a sort of year on year. So that is, is in each year of the MTFP in terms of the medium term financial plan. We have to do that. And obviously, because we have to, to, we have to um, make provision for repaying any debt that might be associated with that, should we have to eventually borrow to cover, to cover the cost? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, just one last question from me. Um, yeah, um, just is there anything? Uh, uh, I mean, you mentioned very helpfully um, potential risks to councils um, in relation to, um, and one of them you highlighted was um, debt in relation to um, total turnover. Are you able to give a figure for Hackney? For Hackney, what, sorry, yeah, in, in relation to the level of debt, in relation to total turnover, we've always, we've obviously talked about. Um, so, so we have got a debt, external debt level of circa seventy million. Mm -hmm. our, our gross our gross budget is around one point three billion, million, billion, and net budget is around three hundred sixty five million, and that is relatively low compared to other boroughs. I'll, I'll, I can probably provide you some charts actually showing how where we sit in relation to other boroughs. But it's worth mentioning as. Um, um, Councillor Chapman alluded to earlier, we are moving into the space now where, where we've got, um, we are likely to be borrowing a much greater proportion um, in relation to our capital programme. And that's because we, our sort of capital receipts now are either either, um, either depleted or they're already committed to projects which are on the capital programme. Thank you. I think I'm going to now move on to the income generation task and finish group. And I think it's quick finish judge from Jackie and move over to Councillor Lynch. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, so as um, Jackie's just spoken about, I just wanted to make a couple of points. I think there's something really important around uh, some of the work that Jackie's done around uh, the council's doing around communicating to our, our residents and people understanding what we have a statutory duty to pay for and what is discretionary spend. And I think it's incredibly poignant that the, the conversations that are happening around councils, particularly Nottingham, is that they were at a point where they, they literally couldn't meet their statutory duty. So I think when, you know, echoing what Councillor Hayhurst has just said, when we are as, you know, elected representatives for our residents, we have an absolute duty, responsibility and accountability to make sure that we are able to provide the high quality and the you know the, the the needs to keep our streets clean our bins emptied our children educated and our vulnerable people cared for um, and that's certainly what i am focused on in making sure that we can meet those duties um, so coming on to that one of the things that the council is looking at and it is very prudent and um, absolutely appropriate is how we can look at our income generation opportunities we've already heard that uh, currently, even with a huge cash injection, our demand for those statutory duties and other spends that we want to do, we need to look at other options to be able to to to, to fulfil that. Um, so, an income generation task and finish group has been set up. I've um, humbly been asked to chair that um, that group. We've met twice. Um, again, similar to sort of some of the conversations we've had tonight, there's only so much we can put into the public domain about that. Um, what I want to really assure uh, members tonight and those watching online is that we have consistently around our fees and charges had a, a set of principles that we, that we always use to, to, to stress test not just the finances but actually are we doing this in an equitable way there's not going to be a disproportionate impact on our residents um, and we've actually carried that through to the income generation task and finish group as well um, so very much it's in early stages. Um, this is all fitting together with the council's overarching um, strategy around the commercial, having a commercial strategy rather. So it, it's all fitting in very well. And, and as good councils do, we have a, a good, great partnership between um, us as politicians trying to set our policies and implement options around income generation and also have the the advice from Jackie and her team around uh, particularly Deirdre and others around options that are coming are being bought and again as as members will know um, and I think it's really useful maybe for that to be maybe uh, made more clear particularly for those that um, 
not always sure is around how decisions are, make, are made around the budget and around things such as income generation. So there will not be a situation where all of a sudden something is going to be going to be proposed. There is an absolute robust broader process within council around things going through to cabinet, then coming to group, and then obviously that needed to be adopted and then being accepted at full council as well. So, um, but it was just more for that. I don't know if you wanted to add anything, Jackie, but in terms of the sort of detail of that, it's still early days, uh, but I wanted to assure that there's very much going to be um, a, an opportunity for, for members to be involved in this as well. And, and we have... Um, planning as well as you can see we've got the we've been scoping we've re-looked at the principles um and then we're going to obviously uh review in november we did have a start to look at some of the proposals and actually we found that there was a, a considerable amount of quick wins so um how do i say this we had certain areas of the council that we can um that are overperforming overachieving um particularly around um Hackney being a desirable place for for filmmaking to to be undertaken, um, that's all I'm going to say. Uh, but yeah, so, and then we also we have to be reminded that fees and charges are regularly reviewed uh, in line with obviously inflationary pressures as well. So um, so those increases will, will 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 happen. But again, it's just to get to give people within scrutiny chairs and those within within the council that we are not just going to hay and starting to sort of um do income generation streams that may not be um appropriate but again it's again balancing our need to, to look at other forms of income that we can we can do to to, to um to, to ensure that we can get the council running um but yeah and um, jackie would you like to add anything or or councillor chapman to what i've just said Hopefully I've covered everything. I forgot there was, I thought there was just one slide, I didn't realise it was, it's my error. Exactly. Yeah, I suppose. But yeah, I'm happy really, to take questions. Sorry, what I really wanted to add is emphasise the fact that we, what we're not doing in this space is, because when you talk about commercialisation, bearing in mind what I've just said about all the section 114 notices, this is within the realm yes. of, of, of things that we manage as a council. Uh, we are looking at potentially mm. um, uh, a, new, a new commercial strategy, but that's not going to be around what you know hugely ambitious is around how we how what the principles are which which the council might want to see to to um to check any income generation opportunities going forward so 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 give us a framework for developing those sort of income, yes. income generations ideas um thanks jackie yeah yeah, I think to add, yeah. I accept to thank everyone involved in that, and um, just to maybe to say that obviously you'll be aware that uh, uh, we're beginning to work more formally, on, more formally on trans like transformation, but um, uh, and and they'll pick up many of the bolder ideas of income and generation in that. Thanks very much, Councillor Lynch, um, for you, um, and for caution on this work. I thought I just thought it was really important that part of our sort of budget scrutiny. Lots of business, but we're aware of this sort of work stream. It's really helpful to hear about those initial stages. So I'll bring in Councillor Hayhurst. Anything else? Um, Thanks, Anna. Um, great work. Um, can I just ask when we introduce or increase a new charge, do the following year we've got an internal audit process to actually check that we are generating more money? than we did under the old system because of perverse consequences. And I keep thinking about skips. So if ever you've ever done a building project in Hackney, you know that the permit for a skip is a fortune. And so, of course, you call up the skip people and say, oh, you, they, they say, you don't want to do that. You can do a load and drop. And so everybody shoves all their waste in their front yard or on the street. You, the, the, the skip man, like, waits, clogs up the road for half an hour. Everybody chucks it in the back and then it goes off. The council doesn't get a penny. It clogs up the road for half an hour. And so, for example, with skips, are we making more money if we are fine than we did before we started charging an arm and leg for skips and started blocking up all our roads? I mean, so all I'm saying is, do we do we actually audit to check that it is actually making us more money? I think I'll bring in Jackie on that one. Right, I'm not going to ask you specific questions, <laughs> but what we would do is because we, as we monitor the budget throughout the year, we're monitoring what the income level is to make sure it's achieving the budget. And one of the things that uh, uh, we've, we've been really careful to do is where we're introducing a new a new charge 
or an increase in charge that will monitor it. It doesn't have an, an adverse impact on demand, basically. It's one of the things that we've um, been very careful about. And one of the things that uh, Council Lynch has mentioned in, in the task and finish group as well, to make sure that we're not adversely affecting demand and therefore by default getting less income by increasing fees and charges. Right. OK, thank you. Are there any other questions on income generation? Um, in which case, thank you very much, Councillor Lynch. I think it's been really helpful to be aware of that work, and I think um, they keep in touch, really. So it's quite some, um, I think we'll, we'll want to hear updates thank as things you. emerge. Um, thank you, Chair. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. So going on to... Yeah, okay. So we've got two more items to try and be as quick as possible. So I, at Article 3, that was Net Projection Scheme and Task and Finish Group, so um, this is our um, tablet response um, to the task and finish group um, just panel last year. Um, we set up the council tax reduction task and finish group to review the council tax reduction scheme model, model in Hackney, the option for the cost of the council to reduce the liability of council tax contributions to relevant working age adults to explore the cost implications of implementing zero base tax reduction scheme model in Hackney. The report and recommendations are finalised and agreed by scrutiny panel in April 2023 and the executive response is agreed by cabinet in July 2023. This has been the first meeting that we've had to review the executive response. This item is to consider the response to discuss the tracking and monitoring the recommendations. Members are asked to consider executive response to agree with further recommendations and recommendations is required. I think it would be helpful at this point for the a chat there may be just a brief update in relation to the overall programme. Progress. Thank you, Chair. Yes, um, uh, obviously it was July that this was produced yeah. and we moved, moved on a bit from then, but um, I think a couple of things. Uh, the, the, the scrutiny exercise itself was really useful in identifying particularly some of the issues that we raised in um, the consultation and uh, we took most of those, uh, I think, uh, recommend I think all the recommendations on board on that. So uh, really useful. It was a really useful exercise and has definitely defined um, what, what, we, what we did in terms of the particular consultation. The scheme itself, we're now formally consulted on um, with a very positive response back from the community and voluntary organisations that, 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 that we engage with. And um, uh, we, we expect that uh, we will be asking Council to implement, Cabinet and Council to implement it. I think it goes to cabinet. Uh, sorry, I don't know. December or January, and certain to council with the budget. So uh, we, we will meet that commitment to uh, introduce that ninety percent level this year, uh, which is like so the year or so ahead of uh, the promise to do it in this administration by twenty six. But you know. Um, the downside of that is that it's needed, uh, as I was alluding to earlier, some of the other length of the government support on, um, there's no government support for this, but you know, the, the, the lack of the housing support fund or the uncertainty about it means that our, the cost of living crisis continues to affect all our residents. And uh, this is a really important way of addressing part of that for a, for a a group of them, but uh, the challenge overall still remains. Thank you. And thank you all for your work on it. Yeah. Thanks very much, um, Councillor Chapman. Um, yeah, I mean, it's really helpful to hear the uh, the update. Um, I don't know whether other members have got any questions. Um, I had a couple. So, um, I mean, thank you very much for the, um, the detailed response to our recommendations. I mean, that is, it's really helpful to see that. Um, I think, really, I suppose my sort of overarching concern is, and this was a sort of theme um, sort of throughout the um, investigation process, so in relation to the challenges around data, and it may not be something that you can really sort of answer at this stage. Um, because there's, um, you know, I mean, 
but where there is um, sort of a limited picture they can range into um, the characteristics of you know the users um, and also how much the council and user accounts have failed to do supplement gaps in the information. So I think that would be something that I think you say generally across the council there's something I would like to explore further, I think, um, within the um scrutiny panel. Um, okay. yeah. yeah, it's obviously really helpful to see the, the role of the, of the Money Hub team um, in relation to this. Um, it was um, a little bit disappointing to see that we couldn't um, have a further um, review of the sort of role of the um, advice services. But again, I think it's, I mean, we've got an ongoing interest in scrutiny panel really about the sort of quality um, of our investment and how that um, can support our residents. So, again, I think that's something that we're probably going to be following up on a more sort of general level. So, the, the, the vice service did participate in the consultation of some yeah. views and we'll be following up on those. Um, yeah, and the money hub obviously continues to do its excellent work. Um, it is part funded by the housing support fund. The, the, the household support fund, so yeah. that is a challenge. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so just, um, to what extent is it partially funded by the well, half, half a million a year? Half a million a year. So it's um, okay. um, obviously the other places that are there are, are, are all used in, in deployed by them to some extent as well. Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, I don't know whether other colleagues have got any further comments on the recommendations or the response. You know, um, I think it would be good um, to have, you know, to obviously have a further report in a year's time from the progress, you know, the nice sort of detailed recommendations we've made. But I think, um, no, broadly, um, I'm very happy with the response. It's really good to see that work going forward. So thank you. Thank you. Happy, happy to uh, facilitate that. Yeah. So now going on to. Well, the next um, panel um, report. So this is um, a scrutiny panel um, report and recommendations on the council's net zero strategy. And welcome to Councillor Coburn, um, who's the council member leading on this thing coming tonight. So um, just to introduce this item, it's recognised that to reach the UK's net zero ambitions require all tiers of government businesses and institutions and regions to work closely together. The Council declared the climate emergency in 2019 has been building its vision to transition to net zero ever since. Pact in the UK generally has made good progress in reducing emissions over the last decade, but it's recognised that faster and more coordinated action will be needed to protect communities and the environment from the effects of climate change. The Net Zero Review was established by Scrutiny Panel in October 2021. It's set up to look at what's needed to reduce, um, to, sorry, it's set up to need to meet national and local net zero targets set by government and council. The review also looks at how the council plans to meet its ambitions in a manner that's affordable, efficient, and fair. The review is amalgamation of work by a branch of the Scrutiny Panel, thematic scrutiny provisions, health and hackney, living and hackney, skills, economy, and growth during the new school year 2021 to 22. Four recommendations finalised and agreed by the Scrutiny Panel in April 2023, and the executive response was agreed by Cabinet in October 2023. This item is to consider the response and discuss the tracking and monitoring the recommendations. After reviewing the, um, yeah, so I'll just, um, so I'll just stop there and um, I'll just um, maybe invite Councillor Tobin, the cabinet member, to see whether he wants to say a few words. Um, I will say that again, I'm very grateful for the um, detailed response um, to our multiple recommendations um, in this space. Um, members have been sent an additional link with the scrutiny response that didn't go out really in the paper, so that's where you should be looking for. Um, and that's okay, I just didn't know whether you just wanted to sort of maybe just say a few words and then we'll go on to questions. Yes, we can see you now, but we can't hear you. You're on mute. Um, there's a bit of, can you hear me now? Yeah, you can hear you. Good to see I'm here. Oh, sorry. I sort of like the last 20 seconds, it yeah. kind of went a bit fuzzy, but um, that might be my internet connection. Yeah. Um, thanks, Chair. I just, I mean, I, I just wanted to firstly just 
really um, to thank you and um, the rest of the panel uh, for your input, um, because I think that, you know, you will remember, you know, we've been talking about since we declared the climate emergency, the council took the decision to very much focus on delivery. Um, and I think that was the right approach uh, in terms of cutting our emissions across a wide range of areas, whether it's in terms of transport emissions and, uh, you know, our buildings and adaptation and, and building our resilience. But I think one of the things that, you know, that was clearly heard from the, the, the scrutiny panel right from before we even started um, the, the climate action plan was, you know, the lack of strategic sort of uh, framework around it and really understanding sort of the journey that we need to take in Hackney to help support our re residents in transition and really, you know, embedding social justice to really heart of it. And, you know, what we spoke about before, which is about making sure that our narrative and, you know, our offer in Hackney is about how do we make sure that, you know, we actually help support our residents in terms of helping save the energy bills and particularly you know the potential jobs that we could unlock in our economy as that transition happens and making sure that we actually learn some of the lessons uh from previous sort of transitions i.e the sort of the you know the the skills and job developments in the tech industries and creative industries and how do we sort of learn from best practices to make sure that when that job transition happens in hackney we're able to benefit some of our most sort of uh um you know vulnerable uh, uh groups at the heart of that um we've obviously now in the process where you know we've announced the climate action plan and i think one of the really key important parts of the scrutiny involvement was around really getting that sort of detailed implementation plan uh which is a three-year plan uh, that details everything that we're going to do to sort of help us reach uh, net zero in 2030 across those five different key thematic areas um, and that wouldn't have been possible uh without your input and um, look without wanting to go into so much so much detail in terms of every single um executive response what i will say is is that what's really important is that we don't stop this conversation here um i think we've got to really think through you know the role of scrutiny in terms of making sure that um one it's holding uh, the executive of the council accountable to deliver on the actions uh, that it said it will deliver uh, in terms of the climate action plan but also um you know we do know that you know in this space technologies i mean you've, you've had sessions around finance for example and um, there are lots of new developments continuously that are evolving um, and we're going to have to continuously adapt and evolve the climate action plan to make sure that, you know, we find the right balance between, you know, being ambitious, but also doing what's the best for the people of Hackney. Uh, and I think the, the involvement of the scrutiny panel is really important uh, as part of that process. So I would love to sort of, you know, explore what that could look like in terms of, you know, the governance uh, that's wrapped around it to make sure that we can help, you know, really embed uh, sort of, you know, our values into sort of delivering the climate action plan in a way that the people of Hackney deserve. But thank you so much. Um, thank you very much, um, Councillor Coburn, and thanks for coming um, along this evening. Um, yes, I mean, I think you've really put your finger on it, actually, um, in relation to the probably the sort of, um, you know, um, very central oversight and recommendations, recommendation one and two about how we're going to be monitoring um, the um, progress of the objectives, um, you know, um, on a sort of on a scrutiny level, um, and also about um, external governance. So I know this is an evolving situation with the um, you know the climate action plan um, and the implementation plan. So um, yeah, I mean, and obviously there is you know so obviously this is work that's been done. This sort of role um, across the commissions, but I mean I do welcome your sort of initial responses into that. But that is something that I think we're going to have to be working together in developing the situation that we need to notice that thing we're doing uh, in stages there, and we will be looking for sort of further updates, particularly on those and other recommendations. Yeah, I mean, look, I think um, if I heard you correctly, because if I, again I lost you in the first five ten seconds, but. I think if we're talking about the, the the first um recommendation and particularly around the work around monitoring i think again it's it, it's an area where and, and we've been open about the challenge it's not a challenge that um only hackney faces i think it's something that all boroughs do face when i speak to my counterparts either through you know conversation or through lots of our engagement in the london councils is there is an issue that we have around monitoring and how do we measure sort of the impact of um how successful we are or what the impact that we're having actually on on sort of our carbon footprint and obviously on Hackney's emissions and I think you know we are undertaking some work but clearly I think around you know linking both the governance and the monitoring uh, that's that's something that we are going to have to very closely monitor uh, and hopefully within the next year one of the things that I would like to see happen before 
the, the annual decarbonisation update going to the full council in July is, you know, is clearly fleshing that out um, to really reflect the scrutiny's um, sort of comments uh, and really making sure that we would bring forward an ambitious plan around how we can make sure we're able to measure it uh, in a way that we could report back in a transparent way and obviously where our residents can hold us account to, to our delivery. Thank you. Um, just had a um, couple of other questions um, which have been submitted um, in writing by Councillor Vinnie Lover. Um, so what forms of community oversight have been seen by the Council in relation to the climate action plan implementation and general net zero strategies? And it, in, then if that's in relation to recommendation one, then in relation to recommendation 20, if we don't mind taking two questions, does the council accept the recent findings of the National Infrastructure Commission that switching gas, gas boilers to hydrogen in domestic settings should be ruled out as an option because hydrogen would be more expensive and less efficient? So that's a question in relation to community oversight and then in relation to gas to hydrogen. Yeah, I'll start from the reverse order. So, look, I think, you know, what's really important for us is, as I mentioned earlier, is, is that there are always going to be the sort of the cost benefit, benefit sort of analysis that we continuously have to sort of uh, evaluate, which is looking at, you know, what is the right thing that we need to do for um, the planet and obviously to reduce our emissions and what we can do is like, to reduce our emissions, but also making sure that we've got a sensible approach uh, in, in that transition. Um, and so, you know, I'll give you an example of that, but completely um, sort of unrelated topic, but, you know, where we look at our, for example, if you look at in our waste services and our environmental operations, when you look at, for example, um, our refuse trucks, uh, our recycling trucks, um, a diesel refuse truck costs about 190 grand, uh, which we now obviously, we, we change the sort of, that to vegetable oil, so that sort of reduces it to 92% uh, in carbon emissions. Whereas if you go out and buy an electric one, uh, it costs you about 420 grand, I believe. Um, and that's obviously, we have to make the, the cost benefit analysis of, you know, for the sake of having an electric uh, vehicle, you know, we're gonna pay three times as much more, uh, which will cost the taxpayer more money and this money that we could better spend, but we can still reduce the carbon emissions by 92%. So going back to sort of Councillor Ben and Lubbock's uh, point is, of course, you know, at the very forefront of everything that we decide, we're always gonna put, the environmental factors and sustainability factors at first but obviously we need to make sure that we have a, a, a sort of a pragmatic approach in terms of how we're getting this transition uh, 2030 is for the council's own direct emissions um and and 45 percent of our council stock um and so what we want to do is obviously is is, is to be able to do that in, tra in a just transition way um so where we can and where it makes financially sense uh, we will do that and then we'll obviously explore new technologies to help us uh, reach there. Uh, in relation to the community input question, um, the first question that you asked, um, I think if I correctly heard you, sorry, I, again, it sort of cut off slightly. So do cut me off if, if I'm not answering the question. Uh, uh, but from I, mean, I think it's community oversight in relation to the council implementation and that's zero. Okay. Community yeah. input. yeah, so look, I mean, we, we obviously, to, to develop, the, the climate action plan to where we got to in the first place we very much see people at the heart of what we're doing uh, in hackney uh, and that's the whole purpose why we're doing this we're not just doing this because you know we want to have a climate action plan um, we're doing this because we know that that transition it serves the best interests of the people of hackney and so as part of that obviously you know people our, our residents had a say via uh, a consultation a public consultation we had the hackney green recovery event uh, that helped develop it. We also had the climate summit online during COVID and the pandemic, which was our version of a deliberative democracy, democratic engagement um, sort of methodology, where it really involved residents in helping shape the five themes, uh, themes. And what we heard from residents was very clear, which is that they want us to talk about things that we could deliver on, but also have it as a wider Hackney Climate Action Plan. So it's not just about what the council could do. And um, what, what I'm very committed to, to doing moving forward, I think, and this could be really sort of the, I guess, you know, how we can really determine if this is really successful in terms of community involvement is, is how we could sort of deliver neighborhood led neighborhood services uh, through sort of neighborhood led conversations. And, you know, I think we need to be exploring more and more sort of deliberative, de deliberative democratic engagement methodologies, uh, whether that be a sort of a citizen assembly, whether that be citizen juries, there are lots of different uh, methodologies that could be deployed uh, to be able to have that conversation and really make sure that, you know, we're not just sort of, um, having conversations in this
sort of the traditional ways, but we're actually able to some of our residents who typically wouldn't engage in space. If I'm being very self-critical of the council, um, when we looked at the consultation results uh, for the draft climate action plan, uh, the majority of people who responded to that consultation uh, earned over 100 grand. And we know that that's not representative of the people of Patney, particularly the people who are more likely to be impacted by climate change. So I think, you know, we want to really commit to our sort of commitment uh, around sort of involving people. But I think the key thing is, it's not, not just about having conversations, right? It's about having conversations with the people who are most impacted. And I think, you know, one of the things that I would really welcome from, from the scrutiny panel um, and from, from colleagues is really your involvement about new ideas on how we can best do that. And we're going to be bringing forward next year a engagement plan around the climate action plan and, and how we move forward and how that sort of complements um, the, the sort of the delivery of the implementation plan. Um, and at that pro point, when we sort of uh, publish that, I uh, would really sort of welcome your your input in terms of how we could sort of strengthen it and really make sure that we're able to speak to people who, as I say, wouldn't engage in the space. Thank you very much, Councillor Coburn. Just telling to colleagues, have you got any further questions on the this stage? Councillor Adriano? Sorry, it's, just a, it's such a very quick one. Thank you, Councillor Coburn. Um, and thank you for the thorough response. Um, it's just with regard to um, our corporate portfolio and social landlords. We've made a commitment in, in respect of both of those areas to kind of push in terms of the renewable renewable energies. Like, it, this isn't necessarily contained within there, but my interest is was peaked um, in relation to our corporate partners, particularly in moving to a place where anyone building in Hackney provide any building that's developed over the next few years kind of incorpor automatically incorporate these factors into it, particularly renewable energy and bringing down costs for our residents and tenants. Is that something that's kind of on the radar in terms of the work that you're doing and likewise linking it to planning and so forth? Yes, uh, that's a very, very important question. And it's a, it's a conversation that um, I'll talk, you, talk to you about specifically what we're doing in Hackney, but it's, it's a London-wide conversation as well as around sort of how we can you know, link up with our partners across the, across different uh, sort of boroughs and making sure that we've got similar practices and we're best we're learning best practices. So a lot of my time recently, I've, I was actually being meeting with plan, planning officers um, from different boroughs trying to understand how we can strengthen our processes. And I know that Deputy Mayor Nicholson has been doing some very important work in relation to our sort of our own local plan, because we have had some challenges around where we've seen people who wanted to sort of do the right thing and do that transition. There's been some sort of roadblocks uh, there. So we want to make sure that that guidance is there for them to sort of be able to address that. Now, in terms of the climate action plan, there is a the thematic area around around our buildings, um, and that sort of t that's aimed to deal 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 with both the the building of new uh, buildings, but also around how do we sort of like help support um, you know the retrofitting of our existing sort of stock, particularly looking at our council estates. And one of the things that we'll be bringing forward to January um, in into cabinet uh, is a paper on a new residential solar project um, and that's looking at for example how we can help you know both would you decarbonize some of our council estates but also put money back into some of our uh, council tenants pockets and um, the other big, big part of what we're trying to do council Jari, is obviously around our own um sort of buildings um as you know we we operate on 100 percent renewable energy but what we are actually doing is, is looking at extending into different some of our other sort of um sort of lease buildings like you know the marshes center and london fields Lido, and we've got additional grants to be able to further decarbonize. So that's looking at ground source heat pumps um, in addition to sort of solar energy as well. So there's a bit about Hackney leading by example, and absolutely you're right. If we are, you know, the real successful bit of, of this bit is going to be around how do we make sure that new buildings are built uh, for purpose, but it's also about how do we make sure that Hackney is bid ready? Um, it's what I said at full council um, last week, which is that what we need to do in Hackney is we need to sort of take an evaluation of our stock of our buildings or our houses um, you know, we've got the Community Energy Fund that we've been doing some great work with Community Energy London and working with Community Energy London, we've identified all of the buildings in, in Hackney that can go solar and how much generally, uh, energy that generates, but also how much um, emissions uh, can be cut from that. And um, so we've, we've got the studies there now. And um, what we need is we need government to be able to unlock uh, funding, uh, but we also need um, the regulatory powers uh, planning wise to be able to act and really move forward on our journey to net zero. Thank you very much, Councillor Coburn. Any further questions? Um, I think we will um, want this back. And also, if I can make a suggestion, there's obviously a couple of members absent. Um, 
if we, with a lot of recommendations, if, if members want to make any further comments, Councillor Cove, would you mind if we collated them and sent them to you in writing, so maybe in the early new year? So. Absolutely, and and just just one other thing to say is as well, it, it may be inappropriate. I mean, not for me to suggest, obviously, how you know how you manage your agenda on your on the panel, but um, there may be sort of an appropriate mom moment annually when you look at, for example, the annual decarbonisation update and how we bring that back to scrutiny panel uh, and making sure there's a process and how you can hold the executive to account. But I'm happy to to pick that up with you offline. But also, anyone got any individual questions or submit. Commission, uh, panel a list of questions, happy to answer that. That makes a lot of sense, and I think we're going to be having some further discussions offline. Thank you. So, a couple of other items on the agenda to get through. So, um, agenda item eight minutes of the previous meeting. Um, so, um, script number 39, in terms of read the minutes. Agreed. Agreed. So, and then the City Panel um, Work Programme for 2023 24. So the next meeting is on the 30th of January. The agenda after to set out the work plan. Um, in addition to the work plan, the item will refer to the quality of the plan, um, that consultation and the end of the spectrum plan. Um, so that would be an additional agenda item um, in the 30th of January. I'm going to have the interim chief executive question time. Please, can members, send topic orders um, over in relation to the um, chief executive by the 80th of December. So I'm getting time. Eighth of December, yes. So just it's um, to me or Tracy before the 80th of December. Any further comments or suggestions? On any other business? No. No. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.